African Society and Culture. The objectives are, one, characterize the extended family units that form the basis of African villages, and second, evaluate the importance of the arts to early African culture. Now, the aspects really of African society can be really boiled down to a few factors, um, but it's all focused around really the family unit, um, the village unit, and around towns in general. So really, really towns began as, as fortified walled villages, uh, and they became centers of government and markets where people really uh, filled with goods from faraway regions would would trade with one another and interact. And in these spaces, we really end up seeing the placement of the family, of the trade goods, and of the cultural ideals um, that are common among the African regions. Now, of course, there are many, many, many different tribes, uh, many different cultural um, quirks and ideas, but there seems to be a overarching sort of African trend or African culture, African society, and African art form um, that, that tends to be pretty emblematic of the territory. And so um, particularly you're going to see lots of masks, um, which was which is a major kind of item of expression uh, in their traditions. And, and each region really expressed itself in different ways through the creation of such art. Um, but in these political structures, we see that common trend of king and subject um, in many different places. Now, now in most places, it was um, so small that there were no kings. It was village, uh, clan-based, or a clan elder. But really, in Africa, we end up seeing the rise of, of um, a, a major gulf between king and common people. Um, later on, but this was not the case early on. Um, early on, because of the size, because of it being so small in most contexts, that people had access to their kings. I mean, we could imagine in the Western world, uh, people can't just walk up to their king. Um, but in a smaller context, this can be seen, this could be understood. Uh, so the king would often hold audience. The king would, would ask all those to come and, and voice their complaints. Um, and usually these would be all based around domestic issues. Um, someone moved their, uh, their marker for their field and it pushed into someone else's yard. Or, um, he stole my pig, he needs to give it back to me. Very domestic issues for the most part. But we end up seeing that merchants received favors from kings, um, due to the uh, the goal, of course, of, of building that trade, of gaining that wealth. And, and the king's treasury really ended up being filled with taxes paid by merchants, um, which, of course, then kings are going to want to support uh, more and more and more merchants because they can get more and more and more um, trade. And therefore, through all of that extra trade, taxes, taxes, taxes. And this is, of course, important for any kingdom, any king, um, but particularly a small kingdom that is looking for revenue. But beyond just the political unit and the, uh, the political relationships that people have, we also see the family unit, which is really the root of culture within African society. So extended families really often lived together. We don't have the sort of micro families that you see in the Western world uh, mom, dad, kid. Um, but we end up seeing really greatly extended families all living together. Um, and this is um, an, a traditional idea, of course, because it's something that's natural that just flows out of early civilizations. So you'd often see parents and children, of course, but you'd see grandparents and, of course, other families. You'd see aunts and uncles and extended aunts and uncles. Um, and so it would be easy over time, you can see, for uh, one family to become an entire village. Uh, and then you would have villages connected with other villages through marriage. Uh, really, so they lived in small, round dwellings. Um, and family members tended to live within one hut together, um, really made of packed mud and thatch. Um, but due to the climate, you really don't have a huge demand for um, really the 
the need to keep warm during winter months, not like you see in Northern Europe and in other territories. Uh, but we end up seeing, ultimately, in the long run, larger communities that were known as really lineage groups. And these really are the basic building blocks of, of African society. These lineage family groups that are interconnected um, through villages and clans. Uh, now, ultimately, though, the question is, which we've seen in many places, what are the gender roles? What are the expectations? What does it mean to be man? What does it mean to be woman? Now, women were, were usually subordinate to men in Africa, uh, like we've seen in many different places throughout the world. And they were, in, um, in most early societies around the world, all over the place, treated um, in the same sort of situation. But, but women often worked in the fields while the men of the village really tended to the cattle or went on hunting um, expeditions. And, and really, so we see a lot of elements to the hunting-gathering culture that's still kind of rooted deeply within this culture. Why? Because they really haven't grown beyond... Um, in a dramatic sense, beyond the uh, early agricultural and hunter-gatherer society, you don't see the rise of massive cities, massive kingdoms. So in many African societies, lineage was based, interestingly enough, on the mother rather than the father. And so people would trace their family line through the mother. I suppose in a Western sense, since we take the the name of the father, um, I guess a parallel, if we could wrap our minds around it, would be that people would take um, their name of their mother and that you would trace your lineage through the mother's line rather than necessarily the father's, which is, of course, a completely different sort of thing than we see in other places. Now, much of the society was matrilineal um, rather than what we've seen in other places, patrilineal. Now, everywhere we've seen, we've seen patrilineal for the most part, that is, driven by male leadership, um, particularly by a father. Uh, but in many uh, societies and, and villages and cultures in Africa, they're matrilineal, that is, they're led by a strong woman, and uh, women tend to be the leaders of, of families to some extent. So women were often permitted, of course, to inherit property, um, and the husband was often expected to move into his wife's house, which is a completely different sort of thing than we've seen in the West um, in the rise of modern society, where you have a deep tradition that the wife moves in with the husband. So uh, African traditional culture is completely different than what we've seen in Western culture. Um, but also, um, you have community questions about uh, how one is educated, how you deal with children, what does this mean as a interconnected community and village uh, community and communal life. Really we see at the age um, really six boys and girls um, left their mother's home, left their mother's training and moved to houses of women and houses of men to learn their respective skills, um, which we see uh, a similar uh, parallel to the Spartans and how uh, men and women at that around that same age um, were segregated from their mothers and um, and left to be influenced by the community um, and so here what we expect is that the men will teach the boy how to be a man and the women will teach the girl how to become a woman and this is an important idea since um, the lots of these villages all depend upon one another. There's, there's no room for uh, the guy who doesn't want to work um, because um, it's, it's so small in this sense that they really need everybody. Now, inevitably, when they reached puberty, young really entered into community um, and entered into the community in general really as full-fledged members. And they would have to, of course, go under ritual ceremony, um, and this would be connected to uh, a symbolizing of their death and really a rebirth as adults, which is really what we end up seeing in most rites of passage, a passage from your adolescence into your adulthood. Uh, and so this is an important concept because by the time they hit puberty, they're considered men and women. Um, which is a completely different notion than our modern ideals. Now, of course, slavery is present in Africa as well. 
slavery had been practiced in Africa since ancient times, as far back as we can even look. And, uh, of course, it's not unique to Africa by no means. It's everywhere. It's present in every society. It was common throughout the world in all places. But North Africa really regularly raided farming villages south of the Sahara for captives and sold them into slavery. We end up seeing northern coastal Mediterranean Africans invading, kidnapping, and selling um, sub-Saharan Africans. Um, we end up seeing uh, similar patterns throughout Africa and throughout African history, not only for export to other places, but you also see this for just internal um, slave trade within Africa. Now, many times this, they were just the uh, slave; these slaves were the product of um, of the spoils of war that these people um, went to war against you and their lives were forfeit because they lost and rather than killing them um, you would uh, put them into slavery which of course would end up being good for them on some extent because um, it will at least they, if they wanted to live um, that they would have the opportunity at some point to be free and to um, to perhaps purchase their own freedom or it be um, awarded to them but we end up seeing the use of, of captives um, for force um, and for forced labor um, on sale throughout African society. And, and this was common. But slaves were not inferior, um, but really trusted servants. This isn't race-based slavery, obviously, and that's to some extent that wouldn't even make any sense, considering that Africans are enslaving Africans in this situation. And they certainly were not seen as animals or chattel. Um, but they were trusted servants to some extent, um, especially as they as they gained position within the home. Um, now, now of course, a natural place that we can turn to um, through looking at the function of society and people in general is their religious expression. Now, most African societies really shared some common religious ideas. Are they all the same? No. Um, in fact, there's numerous religious traditions. But if there is a real um, interconnectedness and common religious expression throughout Africa. Many believed in a single creator God, for example. Um, so the, the Yoruba people in Nigeria believed that their chief God had sent down his son Adudua uh, down from heaven for his people. The Ashanti people of Ghana believed in a supreme God and a supreme being called um, Nayame. Um, so we see this theme of a supreme deity uh, and also a supreme deity sending representatives down to his people, which of course will be an important idea inevitably for the incursion of Christianity and Islam into these territories. But really one way to communicate with the gods was through rituals done by a special class of diviners um, which we might call shamans, perhaps, really with the power to foretell events, to look to the future, to see things that other people don't see, to diagnose disease. Um, and this, of course, could all be done through rituals um, and classic rituals um, that, that are um, even conveyed into the Western world with the migration um, through slavery uh, of Africans into the Western world, into the Americas particularly. Uh, so we end up seeing the importance of ancestors in rituals in general and through these ceremonies. Um, the idea was that these um, ancestors were closer to the gods, and so they could affect the world um, in a deeper, meaning, more meaningful way than what, what we, whom are not dead and are not con close to the gods as they are. Um, so we could have turned to them. Um, but we end up seeing, of course, an important um, ritualized uh, practice. Um, many, many of these div divining elements are, are connected to what we might call voodoo. Um, and, of course, a, a common uh, ritual would be the use of a chicken um, and the blood of a chicken for some kind of spell. Um, the, these are common practices. But inevitably, we end up seeing the rise of Islam in making those deep incursions into northern Africa and pushing south through trade. So Islam really spread through that northern region, really the first 
rulers to convert were the, um, really the royal family of Gao. Um, by the 15th century, we see um, some of the southern lands below the Sahara really begin to accept Islam. But for the most part, um, it is um, a slow process. And it had less success in the mountains of Ethiopia, um, and particularly because you have to remember that there's a deep Christian tradition um, on the eastern coast. Um, and you also have many beliefs in Islam that, that convicted, conflicted with traditional African beliefs and customs. A, pr a great example of this would be um, modesty among females. Uh, that obviously Islam demanded very, very modest behavior, very, very modest coverings. Um, but you don't see that in traditional African culture. Um, largely because of the climate, um, uh, most women don't wear much. Um, so you're going to see some conflict on some level between those two things. Um, but ultimately, Islam's insistence on um, discrete roles for men and women and modesty um, in, in really dress was at odds with, with everything that was going on. And so that was going to be a pressing point for much of Islam and, uh, and the indigenous African traditions. But really in Africa, important ideas were combined with native beliefs resulting in really an Africanized Islam. And, and that's ultimately what we end up seeing is, is a different sort of Islam than what we saw in, um, say, the um, Abbasid Empire in the Persian region. Uh, so it's going to have a very African flair um, as it, it really interconnects some of those older traditions. But African culture in general, um, and particularly when we talk about um, culture, we might even think of art, um, and that's kind of what we want to focus on here, um, really is uh, limited in scope, not... Um, not primitive per se, uh, but just limited. It's not. It's not um, what we'll end up seeing in in uh, Roman history or um, or even the Abbasid Islamic um, glory of building these massive places. Um, we we see something much more streamlined. Um, so the earliest really forms of African art are um, rock painting, and we see this in most uh, hunting and gathering societies. And we see famous examples of this in the Tassili Mountains, um, somewhere from 4000 BCE, uh, but some of the most dominant expressions will be through wood carving. Uh, so when we see this in mass, of course, Africans made mass statues, and really these statues represent gods, spirits, ancestral figures. They might embody spiritual powers of, of various subjects. Um, so these were very important aspects of of artistic expression in African culture. We also see some metal workers. Um, the Ifri, um, really the, the capital um, uh, of the Yoruba, um, they created iron statues, um, which is uh, really different than what we see on a whole in Africa is, is really wood carving. Um, but um, other, other elements, uh, African music and dance really has a deep um, tradition and particularly even a connection to um, really religious elements and religious purposes. Um, and, and we end up seeing heavy rhythmic beats um, really are the, are the major movements in this um, sort of music tradition. But it has a religious element to it that the deep rhythmic beats were, were a means of communicating with the spirits. And when you danced around um, at a certain rhythmic way, it was a means by which one could talk to the gods or talk to the spirits. Of course, music was used to pass on to young people information about history and really a, a means by which they can communicate and pass on their oral narratives. Why? Because they don't really have any written language. So much of this is relying upon um, oral tradition. Now, I mean, other than that, we have archaeological evidence, but no major uh, written systems. That's why, to some extent, we don't really see uh, the label of civilization in, in terms of like a massive kingdom or empires because you don't have the kinds of um, artistic expression, writing systems, um, mathematics and building of massive uh, architectural achievements. Well, that that's not necessarily a judgment issue. It's just that uh, geographically, um, perhaps the territory was didn't lend itself exactly to that, that sort of um, form of expression. And we ultimately see priests 
um, and special class of storytellers known as um, griots, um, that these people really taught the histories and taught the narratives and taught the stories for young people to memorize and learn. And why we tell history and why we tell stories to some extent is really to shape um, kids' identity, yes, um, make them part of the community, for sure, um, but also to teach them moral and ethical lessons. Um, and we end up seeing this through much of the, the storytelling um, in these African groups. Now, first, our objectives were, one, characterize the extended family units that formed the basis of African villages, and second, really evaluate the importance of the arts to early African culture. 